light up. Those of you who were here yesterday will remember that a lot of the chat was fairly nostalgic and autobiographical and only from time to time glancing reference made to the work which is up on the wall for the next day and then comes down. Um, and what I tried to do yesterday was to find various other things which for one reason or another are not necessarily on the wall or are additional material of the same projects. And I've, I've tried to do the same thing this evening. I, it, it will necessarily be less nostalgic because after all it's more recent. And some of the things even when we get to towards the very end, it may be difficult for me to even give an objective view on. I think that talking about the things of, of yesterday was to some extent like talking about somebody else's work. I often feel that um, as one uses more and more distilled material and as one's tastes and ironies shift that, that often talking about one's own work is like talking about somebody else's and you can actually occasionally become quite dispassionate and, and, and one would like to say objective. This evening then there will be the odd thing that has actually been not exhibited because I don't like it anymore or the odd thing which has not been exhibited because it isn't pretty enough or the odd thing that has been exhibited and can't be fully explained by just standing in front of the drawing. This is the purpose of this lecture, as in a sense it was yesterday. Where we left off yesterday evening was a picture of people, a picture of Christine Hawley, Ron Heron and myself standing in Helsinki, symbolizing both the gradual shift towards more and more peripatetic life, the second generation of close uh, associates, the linkages between the second generation and the first generation, the, the, the students of, you know, Chris a student of Ron, etc., etc., and also a view of the Archigram group standing on the terrace of the Sanz Boberg, uh, gazing at its own navel in some curious kind of way. And you also saw yesterday the the slow shift away from the mechanistic and the hard to the soft. And what you will see, I think, this evening is a further cyclical action, including the soft with the hard, and then perhaps, dare I say it, a shift slowly away from the soft again. Who knows? At this point, therefore, we're looking at two slides of, of decay and one slide of, perhaps two slides of decadence. The, the present state of the Forum in Rome and the present state of the Maginot Line on the borders of Germany and France. As I said yesterday, we were taken to see the Maginot Line by some German friends who said, gosh, there's a thing down the road that's very much like one of your schemes. That often happens to me, and the more I talk about my work, the more there is somebody who from time to time says, do you know there's a thing down the road or up the road or on the hill or in this cave or wherever it might be that's just like your kind of thing. And I, I feel that, that the one's reactions to such comments are extremely important, which is that you can react in two ways. You can either say, oh my God, it's been done. Isn't, you know, what, what am I but, but a mere uh, regurgitator of, of things gone. Or you can say, great, that's there you go, there you go, what did I say? Or you can simply get more information because speaking as somebody who does not build as much as one would like, you do need the feedback from real situations. It's one thing to contrive the airbrush, the set of prisma colors or whatever it might be to show what is the interface between a piece of wrought hardware and a growy, wet, slimy, funny, fungusy thing. It's another thing to actually go there and see what happens when it does it. And to say, ah, oh, I see what happens. Now I will, next time I 
develop that idea. The crayon may move itself slightly differently because I see what happens to that piece of metal as it tucks itself in a piece of sandstone. The other thing, of course, is the question of patina. The fact that as soon as you build a building, um, it starts to change, that, that many of the most successful buildings, we are sitting in one now, uh, are not performing for the function for which they were designed. Nonetheless, a large part of our architectural instincts are based upon this question of functionalism. I have the feeling, when I see those marvelous or infamous reconstructions of the Forum in Rome, perhaps they're accurate, perhaps they're not, they all remind me of Barclays Bank, i.e. they are too perfect, too arid, too complete as architecture. I much prefer it looking like it does now, which of course may be some sort of Inglesi statement, I don't know what. Suffice it to say that that was at the back of certainly my mind when working on the Via Appia project, the house at the intersection. Various other carryovers may have been going on in my partner's mind, which is why I show this drawing of one of her student projects on the left. The question of the link between decay and time. The project I'm showing is her five-minute superstar house and the question of the changement of the building with time, which of course was a, was a major theme of the Archigram period. The, the fact that our project for the Via Appia was set up in a place that was full of decay, decaying monuments, a, a particularly loaded street, the Via Appia, and that the notion was that as soon as you put up this, let us call it futuristic building, as soon as it might stand there, it would start to be a monument along with the rest. And so one gets both a physical interfolding and, let us say, a metaphorical interfolding of the very new and the very bright and the very crisp and the very sharp and the very decayed and the very slimy and the very dungy and the very history-ridden and the very uh, mossy. There were more simplified conversations based in the, in the, in the plan and the organization itself, simple, uh, simple metaphors such as the intersection being an intersection of the optimistic and the heroic and the futuristic, if you like, passing upwards from point A onto a platform overlooking the Tiberian Valley. And the contemplative, mysterioso, religious, spooky, hole in the ground, dark, dank, uh, looking back at history, the path B, which would go eventually end up in the chapel-like chamber. And then a few private jokes about modern corners and grottos and other things. Uh, and that, once one starts off with such a simplistic program, the actual architectural arrangement becomes quite easy to do and is really a question of taste. Hence it was that on the telephone, uh, Richard Meyer said, I could suss out your project <laughs> at that distance. And certainly it was my experience a year later when I was the judge of the Shinkenchiku competition that one could and this is a frightening thing to reflect upon. One could suss out the points of origin of a very large proportion of the projects. You're sitting there in Tokyo with 500 schemes in front of you, but you can sniff out an AA scheme, a Cooper Union scheme, an Austrian scheme, a probably Belgian or Luxembourg scheme, and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And the only joke that happened to me, and I, of course, as I was doing yesterday, I digress, was that the Peter Smithson scheme that was submitted the year I was doing the judging, at first sight, I thought he can't have submitted two years running. Little did I know him. Uh, but that I therefore assumed that it was a student doing a very, very, very clever imitation of Peter Smithson, including the verbiage and the way that he holds the pen in the stencil. And yet, I thought, can't be him, but it must be, but like, who else would do it? Uh, and I also thought that Peter Wilson was Jenny, and Jenny was Peter Wilson, but it didn't really matter. At the, at, you know, I think one ex is excused that at the distance of 8,000 miles. I digress. I return to the, this, the central theme of this period, which was the, the notion that not only did I like the, the, the feeling of decay being built into the optimistic, futuristic object, 
But I'm also, of course, interested in the physicality of the unlike, as I was hinting at yesterday. I, I enjoy the fact that, um, and I think one of the best examples of this was a piece of artwork, very unusually, that I actually bought. I bought a, an artwork from a, a girl called Carol McNichol, who is known as, you probably know her as a very interesting ceramic artist, but she did one piece which was a clod of, of uh, grass and mud incarcerated in a, um, in, a, in a perspex block. And so there is perspex, you know, the, 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 the sort of prototypical 20th century material incarcerating this piece of mud and, and grass. And I, I'm fascinated by the notion of the very bright and the very new the very process, the very metallic, let us say, the very urban, the very artificial, yeah. juxtaposing totally with the very normal, hairy, muddy. And a lot of the project, I think I'm still just as interested in that as I was here uh, nine years ago, ten years ago. And so the later version of the prepared landscape, which as you can see has now acquired some other buildings, some of them borrowed and some of them invented for the purpose, is still concerned with that, though it starts also to be concerned with urbanism. And the first Arcadian project, Arcadia A, which was done uh, as a preliminary for the portmanteau Arcadia City, was also concerned with that. It was also concerned with, with putting up the notion of a range of objects in a very restricted space, in a restricted urban, suburban block, going from the bright and the new to the thoroughly spooky and the thoroughly ordinary and the thoroughly gardeny. Um, I think there is, a, there is a sort of structural similarity of, of the program, if you like, between this and, as I was saying last night, the plug-in city didn't happen overnight. It was, in a sense, a summary, a collecting together of a series of, of earlier probes and, and interests in the idea of the throwaway object, the throwaway building, then the throwaway city, and the combination of these objects. As soon as you start to combine them with other layers of programming, you stress them in a way that they are not stressed if they are separate little independent projects. And, of course, inevitably in the cycle, the stressing begins to test the destruction the, the general proposition. The same thing happened with the instant city, which was a pulling together of a series of ideas, circuses, and bits and bobs and things and things. And, and as they were combined together, they began to, 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 to destroy each other. And then at a certain point, you, you move on. The Arcadia uh, town or city has very much the same kind of uh, portmanteau task Though perhaps because it was in its period, because it was looser, because it was actually the assembly together of alternatives rather than a single forward program, it, it, it seemed to last longer. It did the, the, the various sections of the Arcadia city challenge each other. They are alternatives to the better life, but they can coexist, which is a very fundamentally different uh, condition from the plug-in city which says it will be capsules, they will be removable, they will even have the same styling in a sense, take it or leave it or change it. The Arcadia city is in a sense a, a, conf a, a parallel exposure of, of alternatives. Anyway, the, the, the mood of the thing was really set by this, this project. I say inspired by Bedford Park. I don't know why I always keep saying it was inspired by Bedford Park. I don't even know Bedford Park that well, but Bedford Park will do as a slightly decaying, slightly pretentious, slightly creepy, slightly in the wrong place, very inglazy, always more interesting at the back than at the front kind of place. And uh, I even, of course, borrowed from myself because I simply borrowed the Via Appia house and collaged it and then played with it so that uh, certainly the middle strip was actually designed by Christine though she didn't work on the drawing. And it's also borrowed from memory 
and some of the pieces are borrowed, but it's the way that you mix the cake together. I certainly had a London suburban place of some sort. It could be Lower West Hampstead, which I lived in for many years. It could be Bedford Park. It could certainly be parts of outer South London, I think. Anywhere where people walk along in gabardine, uh, gabardine raincoats and, and nobody is going to kick the dog. But it's a little bit seedy. And that was the feeling. And of course, a drawing can't, I mean, a drawing can't get across the seediness, which is a very important part. I think once it became a city, it became less seedy. It became a proposition. It automatically became more heroic. One had to actually make summary statements. And one's nostalgic buds were moving in another direction. I think there's quite a lot of Bournemouth in it. And so I did very deliberately juxtaposed it with a piece of public open space, which actually, of course, could be anywhere. But for the pedants is actually the central gardens in Bournemouth. And I feel that the atmosphere with a quite high proportion of, of public open space offered in the plan is going to be like that. It's not heroic. It's not vista-ridden. It doesn't have great avenues. It doesn't have great pieces of sculpture. It has a few trees that vaguely find their way into roughly being in a line and a, a slight fold in the landscape, but nothing very much. It, in my mind, however, was situated somewhere in the Deben Valley in Suffolk, that is to say near Woodbridge, uh, only because it's a valley I know quite well and is about the right size, has no further significance. And in the city plan, there are offered in, in the various quarters, it's a very simplistic project in a sense, each quarter has a different optimistic offering, a different suburbia, a different lifestyle, a different set of people, and that one 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 are offered as alternatives. And only at the center is this the, the loosest and most, again, in the English tradition, the loosest sort of coagulation. Um, <clears throat> the drawing on the right, by the way, is one that I know that Alvin Boyarsky does not like. Um, I don't know why he doesn't like it, and there's no obligation for him to like it so long as he publishes it, thank you very much, and does not prevent it being hung. And it was, in fact, borrowed back from the Deutsche Architektur Museum at very great expense and loss of life because it's, it's a rather a bother to recolor, and it's actually quicker for me to, to borrow it. Um, it, it falls into that category, which um, I think I referred to in an interview the other day, about certain drawings which may or may not be attractive and certainly don't attract everybody and are not as immediately pleasing to observers, but for me personally contain a lot of graft, a lot of, of some successful and some unsuccessful pummeling at a certain series of coincident ideas. The fact that they don't button it all up may be the point. Um, and for me, there are about eight conversations that I can still remember going on simultaneously in this drawing to do with the object being a reflection of one's cynicism about the program. In other words, the town hall that starts at one corner as the most pompous building in town, the tallest building, the one where the mayor in his chains or the, or the, or the, or the frightened commoner go to, the bell that rings in the town square and all of that, the secretariat full of officious people who are pushing paper and trying to be very important and justify their salaries, down to the sort of the, the small organization that likes to be within the umbrella of the big organization, but would like to make some symbol of its, of its independence. So it crumbles, these little two-man, three-man, eight-man offices saying, I am an office, but I will hide within the umbrella of the, the organization. And then the sort of the loose place where, uh, it, uh, in programmatic terms, I suggest that there is the mayor with his chain of office and all his secretaries at one end of the complex and the bloke selling matches at the other end of the complex, and various intermediate conditions between. And things like the rhubarb patch offered for the center of the city. At the same time, 
one has always been interested in having set up the system for something to push it, to see how far you can push it before it breaks down completely. This is the intermediate point and the system is still not broken down. And I like Edinburgh Castle sitting on its hill where you don't quite know where the official castle, the built castle ends and the rocky hill begins. And the rhubarb patch or whatever it is that I borrowed from central Tokyo. Uh, I like the idea that at the most pompous point of the the configuration of the city and right by the bell tower there's a sort of nothing thing uh, and you have a choice as to which is actually the center of the town. There is the pompous building and there is the perhaps recherche archigram naughty corner opposite the pompous building. It so happened that uh, Christine and I had a commission for a roller skating rink. The guy disappeared from the country and never paid us a bean, but we did actually design this thing. Uh, we designed this Rollerama uh, in the space of about a week, which was meant to incorporate a whole <coughs> number of ideas that you could do with the newly invented silent roller skates. And one of the drawings we did was the interior of the Rollerama. And it seemed to me after the event, the ideal offering as the interior of this building that kind of thing might happen in there. And for once, it expresses itself fairly, you know, sort of direct sense, in a one-to-one -one sense. But next to it is the very tight-lipped, very vicious piece of the city. The first group of people, the first optimistic future, is an optimistic future for New York toughies. At the time, one suggested it was Soho. I think that Soho, New York, has become so expensive that probably these people wouldn't be able to afford to live there. But certainly, at the time I did the drawing, it was still part of the mythology that, that they did. And that people were paid low wages for putting things in cardboard boxes on the floor below, that somebody was inventing a new kind of machine on the floor above, and the floor above that might be for let, and the floor above that might have a very rich uh, art historian living it, etc., etc., etc. In other words, the, the mishmash of the warehouse come living place, come place for the resourceful. And the suggestion in the cartoon is that these people have, as we say, no flies on them, and that only such people could tolerate living in a place made of metal, needing three keys to gain entry, and having a pretty uncompromising level of, of local detailing. And that's what it's about. And it goes relentlessly up the hill. The drawing isn't, is, is four boards long, but it's still only about a quarter as long as it really ought to be to make the point. I mean, I had at the back of my mind, or front of my mind, both New York and Chicago and Hamburg in my mind. And I don't like Chicago or Hamburg. Sorry, Alvin. Uh, but so e it was necessary in order to do this suggested future that I took places that really I felt uncomfortable in. And, and the drawing, of course, is far too sweet. The drawing somehow should be nastier. And this is a self-criticism, too, that, that sometimes one, one, stays, um, one stays graphically far too comfortably within the range that one knows and one can produce in before one gets bored with it. So occasionally, I think it might be useful this is the teacher speaking, I suppose. It might be useful to, to, to force oneself to spend longer on a drawing or even sometimes shorter on a drawing so that you don't lapse into the com what, what feels through the pen or the crayon or whatever, feels comfortable and nice and homely and, and you stop for a cup of tea at the right moment. Sometimes maybe you have to push and draw. I found once, for instance, drawing on hammer papier which I've only done once or twice. It's this very hard German paper that Pichler uses, and I think Ray Abraham uses, uh, which I don't like using. It takes much longer to draw on it, and your arm aches. Your arm aches after working on it for about two hours. You actually have to stop because it's very hard and relentless. But the end result, the pain that goes into it, does cause you to draw something that you wouldn't have otherwise drawn. 
And it must show that I'm lazy, that <laughs> 10 to 1, I sort of next time round, I <laughs> revert back to a nice old friendly tracing paper or plastic, whatever it might be, because my arm doesn't ache and I can stop and have a cup of tea and have a chat and carry on normally. But I think there is this. This is sounding terribly Puritan. It's not meant to be. It's, a, it's another condition. There is a degree of uncomfortableness <coughs> that is sometimes extremely useful creatively. I think that's the reason why I don't like ever doing more than about two schemes just on my own. And that the people that I've really enjoyed working with the most, uh, like Christine, like Mike Webb, like David Green and so on, have been because they, by their comment, make you feel uncomfortable. I can remember marvelous remarks being made by Bernard Chumi on that scheme that we did for the summer casino during that moment. I'm still, and, and that has that same feedback as the hammer papier in a certain kind of way. It's sort of, you can't just drift. It's, it <coughs> throws you back on yourself, and I love that. Oh, by the way, the scheme, which I've drifted off completely, at the top of the hill, slowly the little funny Inglesi romantic thing that was insidiously there. I love insidious things. I love the fact you start off with the storyline, but actually it's the, it's the thing that you didn't like to notice just sitting on the top there, and it's not really central to the conversation, but actually in the end, of course, it takes over, and actually the thing drifts into pleasant, albeit metal-faced suburbia. And I suppose at the back of my mind there were bits of British West Hampstead also sitting there must have come from somewhere. So that the plan gives the game away. The plan actually allows for the fact that even the back is being riddled, is being threatened, and really this, this hard-assed front and its hard-assed lifestyle only really exists on the frontal crust. The rest is already being undermined. What was very fashionable at a certain time, I think less so now, was the whole figure ground conversation about urbanism. I, enjoy listening to Colin Rowan. I enjoy looking at some of the diagrams that uh, certain American schools of architecture are very, and, and German for that matter, are, are fond of producing, whereby a city and the, the conversation about urban space and the significance of urban objects is reduced to the discussion of object in space with reference to object in space. And so I did, an, I did a deliberately sort of cynical thing. I said, right, let's take this plan and draw it as a figure ground diagram and see what happens. Because it, the, the, the notion, that notion of uh, urbanism is so alien to my way of thinking. I do not believe that there are perfect objects in perfect space. The whole thing is to do with amelioration and decay and soft overlay, but let's see. So one had to do terrible things with it. One had to say, is that or is that not a total object? Therefore, does it register black or does it register white? You can't, you can't have it gray, you can't have it dotted, you can't have it fungus-like. It's got to be the space or the object. Okay, I carried on, did it, and I think it makes quite a good figure ground diagram. I think that, that given sufficient time, I could bullshit my way through a crit at Cornell or somewhere and argue the significance of this this object and its historical antecedents and, and the need for cross-references to Asplund's uh, project for the law courts, etc., etc., should... And I'm totally cynical about the whole thing, which I suppose comes from many years of teaching. I mean, you give me the conversation and we'll have the, the discussion about it. But I don't really believe that the great significant... And, and the, I, it was enjoyable to play it to my own. This, I think, you see, is a more honest diagram of the things that really interest me, which is a pink representing artificiality, green representing ordinary, nasty, muddy grass with dogs peeing in it, and the building. And therefore, what is interesting about the space here on this opposite side of the street is the gradual decay of the, or, or the, 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 the gradual artificialness that occurs nearer and nearer you get to the street, or the gradual normality that occurs as you climb up the hill, and the, the artificiality of the building. This, the opposite side of the street, as you may remember from the storyline, was if the 
the south side of the street was metal faced. The north side of the street was just posters. So on neither side of the street did you have a nice place with windows and window boxes. Both sides of the street were hard and, and resistant. But behind the posters was this totally artificial, um, cosmeticized architecture and suitable people for living therein. <coughs> the reference to the Frank Lloyd Wright building, which I've never actually seen. It's one of the things I do want to see sooner or later. Um, Johnson Wax. But I've, I've been very attracted by this whole photograph for a long time. Not only the sort of B-movie nostalgia of the people in it, but, but this artificial Pyrex world. And I wanted my building there to be like that and continuously like that. And I think many of you have heard the story about the apartment before, that such people would be spending so long in the bathroom that even in a two-person apartment, you'd need two bathrooms. And that, that such people would like the idea of the conservatory but wouldn't be bothered with watering plants. And so it would automatically be just a token conservatory with plastic plants. And the kitchen would be, you know, more infrared than infrared. I mean, just totally concerned with instant packages if you bother to eat there at all. And comfortable and highly serviced. So we're back, actually, to a uh, middle period archigram proposition where, where one's discussing the technology of the building. Uh, but there are a few sort of purchasables as well. You could get a whiff of what was going on in the next apartment. The other idea that, that is built into it is the idea of the translucent internal space. I would like, this is, this is um, a sort of preoccupation I've had, like the one I showed last night of the, of the skin that starts as transparent, gradually becomes translucent, more and more solid, and becomes solid. And that was built into the, the Apia house. Linked to it is, is this one of the idea of the quite deep building that is still borrowing natural light. Now, I'm sure that certainly in uh, certain Victorian buildings, one finds that being done with sort of funny old clearsters and so on. But I don't think it has been really possible until probably the mid or late 20th century that we have a sufficiently developed uh, series of translucent materials that have other properties that we could actually investigate the idea of a very deep building. And by deep, I'm talking about something two or three rooms deep. I'm talking about something that's maybe 30 meters deep, at least, where one could still be borrowing a certain amount of natural light. Now, this means that, of course, you get shadows of things next door. I'm fascinated by the idea, whether, of course, it's most appropriate for a dwelling building, other than lived in by these sorts of people, I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea, and I'd love to incorporate it into a scheme. And I think it was um, a little bit later that I saw the, the uh, Villa Maria of Alto near Pori, when one actually saw the power of bringing light over walls into internal spaces. That, that one was, again, of course, when you see something that's like the thing you've been interested in for a long time, didn't know it existed, you're, you're, you're engaged and you're, you feel very optimistic. Men, it can be done. You say, my God, yes, it can be done. <coughs> now, the other thing, it seemed to me necessary that, that if one lived in that part of town, that one would need a sort of <laughs> release from time to time. And the analogy that came to my mind was Vienna. I once spent a week in Vienna during which um, it was snowing and one was indoors for quite a long time. And through the window was Alf Oberhofer's parents' house, by the way, for those who know him. And through the window you could see the, the Steinhof church that Hans showed the other night in the model. And there's something about Vienna, of course, full of these very sophisticated neurotic people living in marvelous villas and so on and so on. But that you can see the Steinhof church up with the trees around it. And I thought, my God, that's a marvelous, marvelous thing that you can see this. And I then thought, if one is living in that part of town, 
in this artificial environment. From time to time, you might look through past the, past the uh, plastic plants onto the hill and see an intriguing, domed, calm object. And adding to the program, I thought, why should that object not be something that has a sort of uh, reassurance, a cultural reassurance? So let the main academic building of the town be up on the hill. And so this is the academy building. Another game that I was playing with that was seeing what would happen if you confronted a sort of version of the well-serviced shed with a version of the, of the echoing stone chambers type of academe. And what I did simply was to collide the two and see what happened. I don't think it completely succeeds, but that is the program of this building, that the well-serviced shed with the teaching corrals and the, the equipment dangling from the roof and so on, attack or is attacked by the large echoing rooms with their columns and so on and so forth. Having done that, I then produced an alternative uh, which perhaps tightened the proposition and returned a little bit more to a preference for one over the other, the bits of, of, of uh, 20th century seem to have drifted down the hill, detached themselves from the, the domed building, leaving the domed building on the top of the hill. <coughs> Another group of people which, uh, which is well known to the English in the audience is the, uh, it's very English, this, this piece of hillside. We've moved from New York via Vienna uh, to provincial England and a s Provincial academic England, I think, the sort of people who, who buy a lot of gramophone records and, uh, you know, work their way through the colour supplements and uh, have a collection of books and, and often have beards, will do a bit of French Provencal cooking, will, will pertain to know about wine and whose wives like to, 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 to sit comfortably. They have rather spotty... In fact, the prefix badge is just cut off this. It, there is actually a prefix badge on this collar. Rather spotty, sort of offensive sons, and rather naughty daughters, and nice dogs, and uh, nice trees, the whole bit. And they play cricket from time to time, and they like to wander about in, in, in a fairly contained place, perhaps golf on top of the hill, and a reading room. I lived for a significant year and a half of my youth in Letchworth, which, as you know, is the famous garden city. And I attended a progressive vegetarian... I'm no vegetarian, as you know. But I attended the, a progressive vegetarian school in that town. And even at the age of 12, I can remember being a little bit... Even at that tender age, I think, cynical about the extraordinary number of curious settlements and liberal, unorthodox churches. I think there were something like, you know, 150 types of church in Letchworth. And still uh, stories about nudists leaping out of trees and claiming to be sort of, I don't know, underworld Catholics or whatever they have. It's full of leftover 20s English eccentricity thing. And that, so there's a whiff of that. There's a memory, a memory of provincial England and, and the sort of things that C.P. Snow writes about in his second book of the series, and Letchworth, written in to the program of this project. Uh, whether the architecture is appropriate to all of that, who knows? Uh, and, of course, back to Bournemouth and the, <laughs> the, the river which gives the town its name being only three feet wide, which I think is lovely as an idea, you know find the smallest and most insignificant thing you can possibly think of and then make a town of a quarter of a million around it, I think is, is, is urban preposterousness, which appeals to me. We, we, on the peninsula, one then shifts to, I think, Austria again. I'm fascinated by Austrians, and if you were here the other night, you, you'll know why. Because there's always the irony and the acid quality of Austrian conversation and designing is never far away. You have to be a toughie to put up with them in personal relations, but nonetheless. And I can't help feeling that on the 
peninsula in, in the town live these people with their memories. And their arboretum, which is certainly real, certainly not plastic, tended carefully, and the dog is walked in the undergrowth, and they have some, they have double height, those, 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 those sorts of volumes that you get on the, the sorts of apartments that Heinz Hollein himself, in fact, lives in, which is a very high ceiling, cool, cream, or white apartments high up in the six-story buildings. And that was at the back of my mind, and I felt that the answer was to build the arboretum into the architecture of the building. Now, strangely enough, and I can't... I'm not sure now whether I don't like the original version. This is the original version of the building produced by that idea, which is double height uh, apartments with continual arboretum condition, where at the lower story, the arboretum has to fold into the, the garden, uh, which is fronted by the estuary. That is the early version in which all the apartment blocks are similar and are smooth. And it was about... And here is the plan at various levels of the, of the apartment, very simple plan. And there is one of the conditions where it drops down and has to, the arboretum has to fold over the garden itself. And for some reason, um, I changed, oh no, we're still on the original version, <laughs> the, the sectional condition here, the double height tower, uh, a, a four split tower four towers coming close together, which is actually a quotation of something I saw in, in Antwerp. Two very fascinating conditions in Antwerp, one of them in fairly authentic uh, Art Nouveau form, and the others in typical uh, 1890s sort of flowery Italianate form, where you get close-packed corners where the, co the, the, the actual intersection of the street is is close packed by very idiosyncratic buildings going off in four directions, so that actually you read the building as being the four buildings and the street just as a, a sort of minor cut between. And you'll notice that both this block and the riverside blocks use the same device where the tower is actually four towers brought very close but cut. Now, something made me redesign the facades about a year and a half later, and I can't honestly remember why I bothered, because now looking back on it, which isn't that long ago, um, I'm not sure whether I don't prefer the original proposition. Here, there's a second series of propositions laid on, which is that as one goes up the peninsula, one starts off with a very fruity uh, piece of architecture, but basically the same plan forms and same apartments within. And as you go up the peninsula, it gets less fruity, more calm, until at the end of the peninsula you have the calmest facade of the lot, rather like the original version. But what has been happening in the plan, if I pedantically backtrack, is that the garden has been doing the reverse. At the f with the fruitiest architecture is the most orthodox, almost French, gardening. As the buildings become calmer, the garden gets wilder. And so finally, the, the smoothest building has the most offensive rocks jut jutting out into the, into the sea. So one is playing a sort of double game of disintegration or, or metamorphosis, as the one is metamorphosing in one kind of direction. The other is metamorphosing in the other direction. Um, which, I suppose, is a more complicated interpretation than the original one, but now looking at the scheme, I'm not sure whether the original one isn't actually the nicer building. Be that as it may, another piece of inspiration is my favourite local building near where we live in Holland Park, which is, which is just a... was built actually as a series of studios and has a blue plaque on it recalling some extremely second-rate turn-of-the-century English artists that lived there. It's now used for recording studios, amongst other things. But it's still, I, it's no great shapes as architecture, but it still has something of the whiff of the lifestyle which I was hinting at in that peninsula. 
Another group of people, of course, are very straight up. The, um, the standard approved family with approved car, approved clothing, reasonable appearance, uh, straight, straight as a die, nice, nice people, unquote, with a nice orthodox plan suiting the nice people. But in fact, just as probably those people have hidden hopes and fears and neuroses and, and perversities, so does the building itself, because it's not nearly as nice as it looks. It can only be used and entered by this rather idiosyncratic pattern. And it's a series of, of variable increments of this continuous building. And actually, it isn't as, as gentle as it looks. From, from the edge, it looks as if it's about a low one-storied building but actually it becomes a three-story building. So there's sort of, it's, it's, it's a little bit n nasty. It's, it's not as reasonable as it should, should be. And that was my program for that particular optimistic view. Another thing that, that the favorite of Ron Heron and I is this particular photograph on the left, which is taken, um, I can't remember it's out of, of the Arthur Korn glass book or it's out of the Bruno Tart modern architecture book. Anyhow, it's, it's somewhere in Stuttgart, though I've never been able to, probably bombed to hell at some point, but it was in Stuttgart in about 1928, a piece of general purpose ground that is glass ground. And I love that one, and Ron, Ron and I are great fans of that particular photograph, and it's really, by the way, what that project is all about, because in fact even the ground becomes glass, by the way. I very rarely do sketches. I'm not a very good sketcher. I wasn't particularly good at art at school, and I, everybody around me has always been a better sketcher than me, and so because you're not good at it, you don't bother with it. And, uh, but just occasionally, about once in three years, I s sort of sketch something which is an architectural idea. That was one. And it turned itself into the hospital building for the... Both of my parents were hospitalized at the same time, and I guess that, that somehow or other that was the reason I did a hospital, which has never uh, formed the sort of published part of the Arcadia city. But it's, again, another of the objects sitting up on the hill. I suppose that the urban proposition is very simplistic, that you have all these six alternative suburbs or quarters, as you would get in a coagulated city, and then up on the hill you get the special object. It's a rather oversimplified proposition, but this idea came directly from that, that occasional scribble, the idea of a stone slab with just hints of the internal structure, with very organized, mechanistic buildings on one side, and a sort of village on the other side, and the idea of this hospital was that depending on what sort of taste you had, your bed would be wheeled in into the village, into the clinic, or into the late 20th century vacuumized space, depending on what made you feel better. If you, if you felt more, if you felt happier in the village, you'd be wheeled into the village, etc. And, and the clinic is meant to be a sort of uh, puerile quote of the typical hospital <coughs> ideal of Switzerland or Finland or somewhere like that. Um, I've lost the drawing. That's why it's not up on the wall. I don't know what's happened to that drawing. And then there is the Riverside Housing. Now, the, the scheme, just like Plugin City and Instant City and so on, did take some time. It spans from earliest drawing bearing the name Arcadia to latest, probably about three years or more. And only when I got to the Riverside did I actually revise the original diagram. So if you compare this drawing with the, the town plan, you'll find it's quite different. And by this time, I become more and more and more interested in the idea of mesh. I'll come to that in a moment, uh, because it was after the Trondheim Library project where we started talking about mesh. And so I was, I not only call it mesh marsh, but it's the idea that it is a meshed marsh is very important to this piece of the city. The idea of layering not only physical elements, but the, the nature of what is datum interests me. I think that so much 
architecture is based upon the classical attitude towards datums, towards the notion of ground line, not just the physicality of ground line, but the actual notion of there being a ground, of the actual notion of there then being a piano nobile or whatever in relation to that ground. And the, the advent of transition between the one and the other being a very important statement. Other notions about the line which is that of the top of the trees, which is t of course very central to urbanistic thinking, not just in Central Europe, but in England as well, as a matter of fact. I, I felt that in the 20th century, this need not necessarily be so, and I've always used in my mind, you know, something like the Tottenham Court Road corner as illustration of the fact that we arrive by underground, we cross by subway, we climb irreverently by escalator, to some level at which it is cheapest for us to be, depending on what organization we work in. And that's a very primitive piece of it. And that already gives you about four types of level. And I've, I've, for a long time, even back to my student days, been interested in the notion of the city as a three-dimensional city. That's why the, the tubes on the Montreal Tower run diagonally to say, look, it's a three-dimensional situation. It doesn't have to work just like that and just like that. I've always been interested in this notion. And I think you get that. The, the, the easy example to quote is going up escalators in department stores, where at various moments you can actually see at least three of the levels, and you're at none of them. You're not particularly at the second level or the first level. You're moving diagonally through the city. The mesh adds to that notion, and the marsh is a statement that even the ground isn't ground, because is it river, is it water, or is it just damp, or are you above it, or are you fishing into it, or are you dangling above that, or are you above that itself? And so it's a, it's a kind of three-dimensional collage. The sort of people, by the way, who might live there are dreamers and romantics, rather sweet, and they live in this sweet the sweet situation at base, or of course the apocryphal ivory tower at top. And it seemed important to, uh, Rebecca might know that particular piece of coastline. I think you were there when I took the slide. Um, the marsh is the analogy. And the th here is another set of drawings that, that's so, sort of boring and not very aesthetic. These are just a series of plans demonstrating the cycle of time by which the marsh would disintegrate and become more meshed. The tiles are established, they're very ordinary. There is the creek pattern. The creeks start to be layered over. The tiles start to sprout and at a later stage sprout very much. Now, I very rarely use these slides because I know they look boring, uh, but they were very necessary before making this set of slides, which you all know well, which shows that same process of gradual disintegration um, involving time. As I was saying last night, my usual process is actually to start off with plan drawings and then to draw the elevations or sections and then often to lose the plans or not, or to hide them away in a drawer somewhere and, and you never see them again. Um, I would like at some point in the future, I think, to do an exhibition or, or something, a pamphlet or whatever the hell it might be, entirely of plans with no pictures of anything. I don't, I'd probably <laughs> bore the arse off everybody, but it would be an interesting thing to do, I suppose, to make some sort of a point. Uh, but one never does, but one might. The sleek building was actually started in the sponge project and then dug up for the purpose of, of this location. And I just remind you of the Via Appia or the Arcadia A to say that really this is the child of that. And I wanted to do... There, there's an occasion, just as I was saying yesterday, that often in... In the archigram time, we would say amongst ourselves, this will upset them. <coughs> them always being an unspoken them, as you remember. And I think 
sometimes a certain sort of cussedness or, or positive cussedness is, 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 is the real thing that ignites you to do a scheme. This was done with a them in mind. The people that still, five years ago, whenever it was, and now, really pissed me off at the sort of scrub wooden table, hacking jacket, bearded, reasonable, guardian reading, boring, pious farts that, that, are, that make up the majority of the English architectural profession. And this building was designed to offend them. There's no question about that. What will get up their nose will be something that's really artificial, multicolored, plastic, tarty. It's a tarty face. It has beauty spots, just like the old, uh, you know, the, the, the latest of the 18th century restoration comedies, uh, drawing attention to, to its artificiality and it will be in an artificial piece of town and it will have nasty raunchy clickety click people who are hustlers you know why not <coughs> uh, gap there for some reason now that's Arcadia City I'm now going to I think if I remember talk about some competition projects and similar because in amongst all of these self-chosen things are projects which have a program defined by somebody else. The usual motive is that, very simple one, one would like to build the building. Second one, one would like the prize money. Third one, just as important, nearly, but not quite, one likes Um, but I start off with something that wasn't, strictly speaking, a competition, although done, in a, in a sense, in competitive circumstances, because it links to the competition schemes. Or I had to stick it somewhere. Um, this is a project which Christine, myself, Stefan Schlau, and Jeremy Frank, <laughs> somewhat curiously called the British team, despite its international content, um, did in Stuttgart. We did it in the, in the Kunstverein, in, in the middle of Stuttgart, a public building, and, and there were 15 teams who were given a piece of southern Stuttgart which, must contain, which had to contain a nurse's hostel, somewhere for the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra to rehearse, and provision for the local ethnic minority communities. Put that in for four and a half days and smoke it. And so we... We trotted along, and these two slides really summarize the area. It is the sort of area where people look behind lace curtains, and the sort of area that does actually contain a few rather raunchy old buildings. And we said, right, uh, the, the, the circumstances of doing this which were that you worked in the public eye. The team was given so many trestle tables and drawing boards and apparatus. And the public came and watched you work, complete with snotty-nosed kids, dogs, television cameras, ordinary cameras, people constantly asking you what you were doing, why you were doing, whether it was socially relevant, what make of airbrush you used, or anything else that you could think that they might ask you. Which is very weird, because sometimes you made ter I mean, something would frequently go wrong. You know, the airbrush would explode or, or you know, somebody would drop ink or, you know. And you'd have to say, for Christ's sake, you know, but pretend it's part of the thing and keep moving on. Very strange circumstances. We produced a scheme in four and a half days for this piece of Stuttgart where we, it's a rather English scheme, I think, because of the winding path. Yes, that's, that's the link with the schemes in the next room. The winding path, going past the Greek church, the English pub, everything for all the art workers. From the lowest piece, it's a sort of curious piece of valley going that way and sloping also this way. So it's sort of a, 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 a pit condition. Um, and this would be a phased operation. You would establish the path down the center of this scooped valley and set up some of the little chapels and pubs and so on for each of the ethnic minorities. And start to wrap around this series of existing villas here. 
at a later stage, you would begin to cross it with this viaduct that would contain student housing and leaving many of the villas and start to build the open air auditorium for the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra and its practice rooms. At the next stage, you would establish some of the nurses' hostels and start to back up with new housing the existing street facades and leaving some of the villas. This is the final plan of the project. And on about the fourth day, three of us did the axonometric. Uh, and it was really a sort of, it's what I often refer to and have referred to in, in other lectures as the back pocket situation. Something that you do in four and a half days. The first day was spent just looking at the site, which leaves you three and a half days. And architecturally, you simply take out what is, is ideas-wise in your back pocket. You just sort of take it out and say, right, we'll do a bit of that, and we'll use those, and we've got that, we know how to do that, and that's what we'll do. And you do it, and it comes splurging out, and as long as you don't drop the airbrush too often, it, it sort of vaguely looks like something at the end. And it was interesting that only we and the, the team headed by Gunther Domenig really produced any architecture for the, for the thing. People like Jos Weber, for instance, sat with vast hordes of people discussing political objectives. <coughs> and, uh, by the way, now other unfortunate, we're now moving into the period when not only does one travel more, but one actually applies, I think the, the, the basic thing is that, that very rarely are English competitions worth doing, even if they exist. And so the much more interesting ones are foreign competitions. And usually you've got a friend who says, hey, come on, do a scheme for my town. It might be interesting if they build it. And uh, I think one has to then use that comment with particular reference to Norway, which has become one of my favorite uh, haunts. And the real link with Norway is, is the unfortunate butt of slapstick humor. Uh, <laughs> called Per Cartbet, who had more hair then, it would have, the, the chocolate cake would have stuck firm, more firmly. But he, for many, was the original Folkestone visitor, and ever since has, has used his uh, contacts to inveigle various of my connection to and from Norway. One of the towns that's been on the receiving end, though it's never bothered to build it, is the town of Trondheim, the northernmost spot at which there is an English cathedral. The, the stonemasons were all brought over from Yorkshire and the stone brought from God knows where to build a Gothic cathedral up in the fjords there. And it's a sort of ordinary-ish town of about 150,000, something like that, with a big university. And at one point, we did a student building. At another point, we did a library for this unfortunate town. The town has been sensible enough to commission us for neither project. And I don't think it's actually built either of the projects. The first of these projects was suggested by Pear as a, as a group effort. And I've, I've jumped around in time a bit here. I think we're going back behind. I can't even remember the date, but Cedric might remember it. But Pear suggested that there should be a team consisting of himself, Tony Dugdale, Cedric Price, and Archigram. And this sort of supergroup, as it was called at the time, uh, did, we, 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 it was one of those amazing situations. We couldn't fail. There were only three entries. It was an invited competition. There would only be three entries. And with this team, you couldn't fail, right? And we all lurched up to, to Trondheim and looked at this sort of tit of a hill and said, God, yes, amazing. <laughs> Very boring location, I remember, for the back of a housing estate. But anyway, he came back and the proposition was a series of concrete buildings for dwelling and uh, eating and watching movies and so on with a marvelous pool in the middle, marvelous swimming pool with stepping stones and things. And then a root system, a ramp system around the outside. How, I asked, was it possible for us to come third? <laughs> I think is what we did. 
Uh, but it's a, I was only talking to Cedric about this, I think, a couple of days ago. We still hark back to this scheme. It, it still provided a lot of laughs, but a lot of ideas for subsequent projects, certainly speaking for myself. I think that if you look carefully at the sponge stuff upstairs, which I was talking about last night, you will detect references to this Trondheim Student Center. And if you then look at the other Trondheim scheme, which I did with Christine, you will see certain references to this Trondheim project, the notion of the solid elements within the glass skin with the winding path that attends them. Daytime, nighttime. <clears throat> and I come to that project. The building is in a different part of town. We're actually in quite a, a decent part of Trondheim now, down in the valley, in the old town, on top of some ruins. And the requirement here was for a library which consists of many different independent uh, sections, children's libraries, music libraries, antiquity libraries, uh, county libraries, etc., etc. And what Chris and I did was we, we had between us two notions. Chris had the idea of it being a garden, and I had the idea of it being a theatre. And that's really what it was, plus now I think the memories of the other Trondheim scheme. Uh, by this time one had no illusions that with you know, 75 entries one would get anywhere with the competition which we didn't. Um, but the, I think it's also a project which I constantly find myself referring back to. I, it, it's a funny thing that I think the competition projects have sometimes had more feedback onto the loopy or self-motivated projects than has happened the other way around. One might have expected it to be otherwise. One might believe, one would like to believe that if the self-motivated projects, the non-program projects, are the research, therefore the research would be used in the more pragmatic projects. But if I look hard at it, I think the competition projects have often had more physical ideas by the way, that have then fed back in the other direction. I certainly think it's true of, of, of this project, the idea of the cocoon. Again, that preoccupation between transparency, <coughs> translucency, greater opacity, but in this case, no total opacity, because the internal buildings are the opaque ones, the rock, the rock buildings around the garden, the space of the theatre, each building having its own character, but latched on to the parent, which is the basic structure. Again, Frank Newby, the engineer. Again, the winding path, the ordinary part of the building, and then the disintegration now happening into the pit of the building. The other, the other link over is to the Via Appia house, because this scheme came fairly shortly afterwards, and, and we, we quite consciously borrowed some of the things we'd played with in the Via Appia House in this, which is a much more uh, determinate project. The other reference, the interior, the building, the garden, as it were, which is the lending library, and the library buildings around the edge. The other thing is the, the Britannia Palm Garden, the Britannia Hotel in Trondheim. I, I love this, not because it's the world's greatest room, though it's not bad, but the notion of this very sophisticated room 500 miles from any other thing that can be as sophisticated. I, I love that. It's, it's, it's really the ocean liner proposition again. There you go in this, you know, nowhere place in Norway, surrounded by fishermen and hills and, you know, housing estates and m m miles and miles and miles of mountains. And you go in the door and suddenly there's piano playing, palms, nice menu and a well-mowed lawn and it's it just it, it's it's lovely that i mean i really think it is again a case for architecture environment as artificiality not contextualism it's the absolute op opposite of contextualism if you live in such a boring town and have to spend half your life on the north sea or upper hill with a goat 
then you want real quality when you go in that door. You don't want something that reminds you of the bloody hill or the ship. You want the, mis the mystery of the East or something. I think really that that's what architects can offer. They can offer theatre. And that was, Christine's never been to Trondheim, but the whole time we were doing the project, I kept banging on her about this thing about the Britannia. I think she, she, if she heard Britannia, Palm Garden, again, she'd throw up. I mean, it was, I said, you know, what it's really got to be like is the Palm Garden is this marvellous. But that was an inspiration, that, that one felt that at a slightly more public, cheap level, if you like, any old fart in, I mean, Trond, you know, in, the Norwegians have a high have a tremendously high standard of living. They are nearly all bilingual. They have lots of English language books and lots of Nordic language books. Any street corner, they can buy virtually any book they want, and they mostly have the income to do it. So what is the role of the public library? If we think about it in you know, paternalist 19th century terms, it has to be something else. It's got to be a place where you go because it's damp, usually, in Trondheim. And it's something to do, and it's something to watch. And I feel if any old sort of carpet slippered gnaw wandering around the town and could go in there and suddenly get this possibility of, of creeping behind Gothic corners or looking down on the garden or just sitting up in the cafe watching or pretending to be researching. I mean, I think libraries are lovely for people who pretend to be researching. Actually, they've gone in because it's warm, or they've gone in because they want to read a dirty book, or whatever the hell they're doing. And the, if the Britannia Hotel Room is an excuse, I think that's an excuse, too. And of course, what <laughs> the irony is in there, you get the, the, the delicacy. I mean, there's a, there's a double flip, because the delicacy on the menu in the Britannia is this piece of fish that's supposed to have been sitting under a stone for a very unhealthily long time. And that's the thing that you pay, you know, 500 plonks for. Um, <coughs> the tail of the arcade creeps out as a little old sort of Victorian arcade entrance. Again, shades of Bournemouth. And the section involves mesh, and mesh came up almost as a sort of by the way. And I think it, it actually wasn't, I think it was probably Chris who's, who's first said we, that, that th we could use sort of meshes. And mesh became a buzzword on this scheme, the idea of, of layering and using meshes of apparatus that weren't only major structure, but weren't only very, very minor structure like bookshelves, but were all way of handling the intermediaries between the main spaces. And we kept talking about mesh. And from mesh, so from that competition scheme, a sort of by the way technique for doing something became a preoccupation. And from the Trondheim meshes grew the other mesh projects. The other thing is just again speaking as teacher or 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 uh, competition doer. There, there was one thing that, that cropped up during the making of this competition, just like I was talking about the, the programming that was necessary on yesterday on the Monte Carlo scheme. The programming, at a certain point in time, the realization that there was one drawing that would really, really, really show the whole idea, but that it was going to take a hell of a long time, and we suddenly had to stop in our tracks and say, to do that open art section, it's going to take three weeks. Jesus, can we afford three weeks? Can we invest three weeks into this one drawing? And you know at a certain point you've got to do it. In fact, it was Christine who did it, so maybe for me it was the easy decision. But we said, right, really to do that scheme, we've got to do this very difficult drawing, which is the open art section. And from that, you will see the whole game of the building. And then having taken that decision, it, it, it sort of, it's a sort of penance. You clear the mind, but you, you know that, that that you must do. It was like deciding that we had to do 57 drawings on Monte Carlo. It's a, it sounds horrific. But once you've decided, you do it. By the way, the meshes, many scribbles of meshes, many examples of meshes, uh, 
Chris's scheme for a mesh. She's never seen the banked Edmund, ver Edmund version, but it's very similar to her drawing. Uh, you, you, you go around the world finding them. Bank takes you to see his building. You say, oh, my partner's done a drawing just like your building. He says, oh, well, there's another one up the hill, by the way. You're in Carlsruhe, minding your own business, or trying to look at the very boring... I remember the first time I ever saw the very boring cardboard castle was actually with Dalibor, who's sitting here. Uh, what I didn't notice on that occasion, and it was sort of four years later, was that near to the cardboard castle is a marvellous piece of sort of... of uh, by the way architecture, this wall, the orangery at Karlsruhe, which has this strange mesh architecture attached to it. Now, nobody, I've asked several times in Karlsruhe whether it was intended to be glazed or not. And some people say, yes, of course it was intended to be other, uh, glazed. And other people say, no, 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 no. It was always intended to be this, and it's just a, a garden artist. I, quite, I don't actually now want to be told the official truth. It might spoil it. I like to feel that we don't know. Just like in the Via Appius story, do we have the optimistic end to the story or the pessimistic end of the story? Schwetzingen, down the railway line from Karlsruhe, is another place, not only the Trompe Loy part of it, but this, this meshing game where the hard architecture is seen almost as a double take as a memory. And I think this is really the uh, remaining interest of the mesh idea is that it makes double take an essential part of the architecture. We did actually build one, which for me is a, always an unusual experience. We did actually build one in Linz. And this is the Linz Pavilion, Geschwindigkeit speed and information building or pavilion. That's the model which shows the series of meshes, each of a different scale, layered back, speeding up to the back of the pavilion. And uh, some wit placed us next to this gentleman who had the next pavilion here. Um, Bob Stern insisted, every time I got the camera out, he insisted on standing right in the middle of, the, of our <laughs> patch. And I had to wait till he'd sort of disappeared off the next day before I could take these, these photographs. So the, the series of meshes exists inside a dark blue box. And one then takes a winding path in amongst the, the series of meshes and a sort of collage of newspapers, which I forget quite what that was meant to symbolize, but it, it seemed a good idea at the time, uh, was dangled in between. Funny how the drawing puts emphasis on quite a different series of things. The winding path in Frankfurt um, one of the museums proposed for Frankfurt is attached to an old Carmelite church. And the proposition is for a museum of antiquities, mo Roman and, and post-Roman antiquities. That is the existing piece of building, and the museum had to roughly double the size of the, of the building. The winding path here in our project is used to interact with the, the new and old spaces as a storyline, but also as a way of looking at the same objects from several different dimensions. We, we, we felt that it was terribly boring to just go into a museum room and see the thing in a glass case or in a very nice setting and to say, well, that's it, let's move on to the next. We were very interested in not only taking the Gothic church, but in a sense, re recreating certain Gothic conditions. And I think this started with the Trondheim Library project and continues here, where one is interested in seeing things by glimpses, not just full frontally, but by glimpses, seeing them through other things. The mesh conversation, again, the mesh in this case, acting as a rack upon which some of the exhibits would be hung. And the path then 
worming its way around the rack and then into the nave of the church and out. Um, here's the formal drawing of the start of the ramp climbing up, turning at this new apsidal condition, returning up higher, and then see, for instance, if you have an exhibit, say, there, you see it slightly from below, you pass it, you can look back at it, and then you pass it from above again. And if you're in another part of the building, you can see it yet again through other things. And, and if one looks at certain uh, screen conditions at the eastern end of Gothic churches, for instance, often where there are choir stalls or where there are clear street conditions or where there is arcading, you get these conditions of glimpsing through things. And that was at the back of one's mind. So in a sense, although adding to the Gothic building, one was increasing its Gothicness. the entry, the beginning of the climb, the uh, research laboratories and admin is in this piece of the building. Climbing, and then the very, very hottest piece of exhibit would be dangled in this apsidal condition and dangled slightly below so you could also get a glimpse of it from the street because another thing we wanted to do was to sort of dangle some of the wares of museum slightly outside say come on have a look inside and then people would come in and climb up uh, and this is a, a long cut section through through the building one often ends up with these schemes taking the sections lengthwise through the building rather than just taking cross sections um, it seems very necessary here is the return condition passing back with the entry having happened at that level. So with one still climbing and then reaching the highest point around here, and then at that point beginning the descent again. Somebody called Justina Karakiewicz worked with us on this scheme, and she was actually responsible for a lot of the more atmospheric parts of the drawing. I don't think it's either Chris's or my style to we kind of think we can do it to, to pencil shade in this manner. But it was very, it seemed very important for this particular project to have gothic, gothic kind of, uh, I was going to say coloration. Turning around the old apse, there's the old apse and the new apse. And then finally working one's way out of the gothic building. Uh, the other, I think I remember that the other time we were, the other thing that we were looking at at that time was, was Asplund, although it doesn't immediately look to be a sort of Asplund influence building. I remember Asplund coming into the conversation rather more often than not. Now, there was a funny, si one of the tedious situations occurred, which was by a, a, a series of mishaps with the the judging panels of competitions, that, that the two competitions had to be handed in on exactly the same day. Both this, this competition for the historic museum in the Gothic church in downtown Frankfurt, and the Don competition, which was for a, a, a key company headquarters in an industrial estate in Brühl, another part of Germany. Totally different si situations, totally different sets of requirements, totally different pitches, and one had to do them at the same time. It was a real Sir Jekyll and Hyde situation. Um, the nice thing about the Dom competition was that we did it with Ron Heron. As you remember from the story last night, Chris was a student of Ron's for four years, and it was very nice that, that we all on this scheme worked together. And I think that um, we ourselves can very clearly recognize the three influences. There are aspects of the building that are very, very closely our three personalities. And um, I don't know whether I can sort of explain that fully. I will try. I think the, the totality of the outside skin, although you're looking at the, the heroic bit, the entrance with the DOM, uh, the, 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 the sort of sleekness, relative totality of the outside skin is something that neither Christine nor I would have done. 
But the games with the water, the Chatsworth quotation waterfall, and certain of the games internally with the water are things which neither Ron nor I would have done. And I think some of the path games, the twisting path games, turning path games, are things which neither Ron nor Christine would have done. And so I, as these three particular characteristics, and of course the building is actually, of course, the play between the waterway, the pathway, and the skin. Uh, quite who is responsible for the pylons, I'm not quite sure. The, the proposition, the, the, the rules of the competition, very, very heavily stress that the DOM of the key company should appear on the scheme. And the trick we did, <laughs> rather simplistic one, we said not only will it appear on the scheme, it will be the scheme. The O will be the arcade. Now, the arcade in this case has been brought in from the edge of the building, as in from time, into the center of the building. It's a central spine arcade. But the arcade is not actually the whole path, nor is it the whole stream. The stream and the path play silly buggers in amongst that O of the arcade as it winds round, rather like the condition of a railway line and a river as they pass down a valley. If one observes a many natural valley conditions, you find the river is sometimes in the center, but sometimes sort of near a rocky edge. And the railway is also sometimes crossing the river and then climbing up the side. So it's just, it's, it's that sort of game. Um, and the O, therefore, is the arcade condition. The M was incredibly convenient for rooflet space. It gave you two roof-like conditions straight off. And so that was ideal for all the drawing offices and the upper level offices. Therefore, the D was for anything else that we couldn't think of that went in the O or the M. Uh, and we had a few trials and tribulations twisting the DOM around at the corner so that it read DOM from the front, but also read DOM from the back. Uh, that was the awkward bit. <coughs> there it is twisting round. Uh, the, the axonometric drawing cunningly not showing you <laughs> where the trick occurred because it was a bit of a naughty. The judges gave us a prize but said that it, it was too nice and the workers wouldn't do enough work in it. <laughs> sort of backhander. Anyhow, they never built it because apparently Dom sold itself to some Gillette or somebody and, and so they haven't built the building either. Uh, nor have they built the Trondheim Library, nor have they built the Trondheim Student Center. Uh, but the money would have been handy. There's the model. And there is a, a collage showing the effect back as the ricochet dom would face the autobahn at the back. So the idea was as you drove at great speed on the German autobahn, you'd see dom, 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 dom. <laughs> and as you drove at much slower speed down the side road, you would see dom, and you'd come in. The Smithsons like this scheme for some reason. They, they told me the other day that it was their favorite of, of our schemes. Uh, I don't know why. That, 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 I just throw that in. I mean, I can also say that Leo, the only scheme of mine that Leo Crea likes is the one with the grid, the one for the regular family. You can draw whatever conclusions you like from that information. Okay? The peak project also that we did, not the famous one, is also a twisting path with a stream condition crossing it. And in this case, this, this is an early scribble, by the way. And the stream condition is contrived very carefully so that because of the, the lie of the land, the stream, instead of being a rather quiet stream, as in the Dom building, is a fast-flowing stream. And it, it virtually grazes the certain parts of the building, particular key intersection points, such as these two. It flows very fast and drops down waterfalls. The idea being that the water and the sound of the water would be a very important part of the, the actual atmosphere of the building. This is the entrance condition. 
um, as it starts the bridge condition diving across there somewhere. And this view is taken from the back of the building, which is mostly, again, a series of nets. The, the tennis court net became the sort of generating idea for the back facade of the whole building. So the back facade would simply be a series of dangled nets. And all the architecture is sticking out forward down towards the city. And here's a typical piece of the building, the, the waterfall conditions, which you would hear as you crossed in these various bridges. And a detail of the small-scale meshes or nets or flight screens or, or Chinese parasols. And the day-night thing, the hand handrails and the il nighttime illumination. So that in actual fact, it had a sort of daytime, rather solid central building with these bridges leaping up over the water behind it. And a garden, an arboretum space, again, in the crotch of the building. And then at night time, it completely reversed out and became a, a kind of artificial um, slight reference back to the sleep building. Thing. So just on the hill, you would see this very this string-like series of lights and not see very much of the detail of the actual building. And then competition time again with a much longer subsequent history. And we still haven't totally abandoned hope that this building will happen, although it hasn't come out of the ground yet. And that's a very, very long story, we have two clients, one of which has the money, the other of which can't raise the money, but the one that has the money is too mean to build the windows that it, the building actually requires, and so there's a sort of stalemate condition. Um, the location, now most of these things have been places where one can spin a, a fairly self-conscious story about atmosphere, locality. They're mostly urban, so even Trondheim, give or take, is urban certainly at the library district. Here, we're out in the, in the backwoods of the Falz, uh, which is supposed to be one of the poorest parts of Germany. I mean, it's all relative. It looks incredibly well healed to me, but I'm told it's poor. And it's actually a rather good site. It, it, the back of the site looks out onto these small towns and churches and woods, and it's really quite a picturesque site. And the other direction of the site is a stone quarry, which was actually used for some of the stone that built the Empire State Building. It's red sandstone, which was shipped to the United States. And the site for the Blue House is roughly there, just, just up and behind the edge of the quarry. The plan for this piece of town, it's on the edge of a small down here is about a 12,000 person Faltzish town. And up on the hill, uh, somewhere there's a castle. I've lost the castle. It's maybe it's, there's a castle. And then behind it, a flat piece of hilltop, a stone quarry. And what we planned is this development for about 2,000 people. And the competition for the solar houses involved certain pre selected parts of the total, the rest of the normal housing. And it was an invited competition, and we did four, four house types, of which two were successful in the competition. You didn't actually get a prize, but you simply got the town saying that they would subsidize anybody who built your houses. So it was like a sort of selection process. Very few of the houses so far have gone up. I think about three or four solar houses have, have actually gone up, all done by the most boring people, and the Ungers ones, and our ones, for instance, have, as I say, are still sitting in a, a funny state of, of, of uh, limbo. The occasional scribble, the fried egg scribble, which is a favorite of mine, the, the generating idea of, of the yellow house was a fried egg, uh, which then became folded ground. The generating idea of the blue house was actually this set of scribbles, which was part of a much larger house, and, and the blue one, which generally seems to be the goer of the group, uh, had a very interesting gestation period, because what we decided to do was that Chris would do one, one house, 
I would do one house and we would share two. But in the end, it didn't quite end up like that. And the blue house had a real back and forth history. Christine started it. And this is one of her early scribbles with the very rambling back. I then took it over and compacted the back and changed some of the bits of the front and then threw it back at her. She then developed the back and then she threw it back to me and I developed the front again. So it was a, it was a sort of double, double collage system, which we used also on the Trondheim Library and various other things. The Trondheim Library would deliberately have a system of person A would draw the western facing section and person B would draw the eastern facing section. And then you'd swap drawings and redraw the eastern and western facing section and then swap the drawings back again. And, and the theory, our theory on this is that it, you actually knock out the theory being that you knock out the bugs. And that if you can carry the idea sufficiently to explain to the other person what's going on, or you do it through the distillation of the drawing, you actually knock out the bugs and you feed in additional ideas. I don't know whether other groups of people work in this way, but it certainly works when you have a two-person system. When we're doing the DOM scheme, uh, on a three-person system, there were, of course, two of us working in one room and Ron visiting at about five o'clock each evening. So you'd then get a, a sort of scribble system where each of us would go away and do scribbles and then you'd put them all on the table and, again, bung out the ones that didn't seem to be goers. So that all the time it's a, it's a sort of um, editing process. I think editing is the nearest analogy I can use to the process. Um, these were some of the, the models of the, of the various houses, the, the yellow house, the green house, which was a nice one, a um, bit over elaborate, but uh, quite a favorite of mine, although it was mostly done by Chris, but the, the, the jury didn't like it or thought it was going to be very, very expensive, which it probably would have been, but quite a favorite. And a funny thing about the green house, oh, and the red house, which we never show anybody because it was the bummer. The red house was the last one that we did. And we were trying to be simple. We were trying to be modest. I think that was, that was the downfall. I really do. I think that we're not architects for doing modest buildings. And it really misfires when we, we were trying to be cottagey and local. Forget it. Uh, the green one is interesting because it reminds me tremendously of Los Angeles. And I think at that time it was about at least a year or more before Christine actually went to Los Angeles. But it so much looks like a, a Los Angeles building, which I find intriguing. Things like that always puzzle me when somebody does something which is as if they have been to a place but they haven't. Is it just done through the literature? Is it just sort of done by looking at books about... Schindler? Can't we just, it's very funny that. And it, it ha it's like these things where you do something and you go and give the lecture and somebody says, there's a thing just like what you did up the road and you've never been near the place. Weird that. Um, the yellow house, again, started off as a fried egg and it ended up as a saddleback. And it, both it and the blue house uh, are very preoccupied with conditions of, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a solar house, mainly passive, very concerned with systems of shading, very, I mean, the whole business of the design of these houses is really to do with, with uh, set square stuff. It's all to do with adjustable set square stuff, constantly ch checking, rechecking lines, and also building 11 layers of skin. Working drawings for the Blue House involve 11 layers of skin, uh, heat barriers, damp barriers, second layers of insulation, three layers of, of uh, two layers of concrete block, one layer of in situ, etc., etc. This is a funny, uh, when one's looking out nostalgia time, photographs like this, this is our first meeting with the, the client who has the money. This is Mr. Kolb, a very successful painter and decorator. Uh, Mr. Stefan Schlau, who some of you know the intermediary and, and interpreter, and uh, Christine and myself dressed in white and trying to look desperately respectable. <coughs> and reassuring and cheap. <laughs> and uh, 
later stage, working drawing stage, where as only on a much smaller scale, as in the Monte Carlo scheme, once the thing starts going, the brief changes very, very radically. And the, the battle, of course, is to keep the basically the same building whilst absorbing extra bathrooms and taking away garages and this, that, and the next thing. Um, one thing that did get absorbed is, is a second balcony condition on the outside of the building in addition to the internal balconies. The idea being that each member of the family would have his or her own internal balcony. We've managed to hang on to that idea. The other thing that gets developed, and this is mostly Chris's work, the north facade starts to become a bar relief game with, we thought that since the client is a, a painter and decorator, he would appro approve and appreciate the idea of exploiting layered painting and decorating. Um, some of the later developments at the back of the building A later development of the same scheme for, believe it or not, Pool Harbor, involving a back block for kids and a deck system climbing up the cliff. And a city made of solar houses. Sometimes one just likes the idea of testing a proposition to the city. And as some of you will remember from an earlier exhibition we had here, Soon after we did the solar houses, and, and, and perhaps partly as a, as a reaction to the tough talking and the tough calculating that's involved in, in, in the solar house, one working to very, very tight strictures, the shadow house was a sort of great release and great, great sort of opening art. And, and if you recall last night when I was saying that the Bournemouth step scheme was where we let it all hang out after the very, very tough period of working through the doctrinaire uh, Monte Carlo scheme. And here again is a scheme that lets it all hang out, very exuberant, very, very uh, open against the tough conditions of the solar houses. Now, the basic proposition of the shadow house um, is that there is a rock condition to one side, open country, the other, the city itself on this side, and garden conditions on that side, different kinds of pressures onto the house. The city erect a, a, a ruthless series of axes. The garden, therefore, having a very soft relationship to the actual edge of the building, very ambiguous line. I mean, difficult to say where is actually the line of the edge of the building the open country being faced, the city being attended very dogmatically, and the building then lurching itself onto the hillside, which has a series of streams dropping off of it. Um, a lot of these diagrams involved, which we very rarely show, but interest us tremendously. I've always said to students that, that the thing that, that we've done a lot is to do enorm innumerable plans, always with, with levels. I mean, always with lots and lots and lots of levels drawn on. And we're very interested in folding and layering and meshing and folding and turning and folding. And, and therefore, precise levels very critical. It's why I think one of the other reasons why I could never stomach doing a, a rational or a postmodern building, because they're not, by and large, interested in levels. They're often very flat, very orthogonal buildings, which say, you know, major floor, next floor, next floor, facade, structure. And, and I suppose it's an, a certain English tradition, perhaps picturesque, perhaps to do with with sort of making things out of elastic, I don't know, but one's always interested in turning and folding and winding and turning and folding and wrapping and layering, and folding in, in and back. So that there are often a lot of these sorts of drawings only just concerned with tucking something over. I mean, th that is the sort of essential architectural motion. It's never, it's, it's, it's very rarely that and that and that. 
even at the small scale of, say, the blue house at one level, or, you know, the layer city or something like that at another. And then, therefore, the project itself is really the direct consequence of that, that there are a whole series of turns and twists and repeats and enlargements as the repeats occur. I haven't really got time to explain it. It's taking far too long. Um, I also like photographs such as these, which don't take the full frontal view of the... I think that... that too often in lectures, I notice I have explained the scheme by the full frontal view of the model as you see it in the exhibition, and the four-square presentation of the plan below it. And you say, there's the central axis, there's the secondary axis, there's the thing at the back, there's the thing on the left. Whereas actually the building is very much more about these sorts of conditions. And the placing of one type of architecture over on to another, rather like the yellow drawing with the stairs upstairs. This piece of almost, uh, almost German Expressionist base work is very important to see alongside that, which has its derivations from a totally different sort of place. The plan is mostly Christine's work, and the model is mostly my work. And there are lots of, again, private jokes about um, the Tempietto, private jokes about sort of Scandinavian sun balconies, private jokes about what would have happened to the Trondheim Library, etc., etc. And inevitably, one moves on from that scale to the urban scale. Now, I think the layer city is a little bit less of a compendium than some of the other city projects. I think it's, again, a slightly looser project. But it start, in fact, it starts off with the shadow house. It, this is a funny thing. The shadow house starts off a train of thought that says, let's see what the urban extensions of it are. So one starts off. There is the shadow house itself. The hill going up on the left, the city coming down below, the gardens going off onto the right. And it's Scandinavian because at this time I'd been more and more exposed to Oslo. So I take a slightly hypothetical piece of Oslo Fjord somewhere down slightly south of the city with the sorts of rivulets that you get, the sorts of very sharply rising hillside conditions. And the city uh, is a diagram of roadways and parkways and icons. The red items are, are, are kind of fixed objects, to use the Smithson term. And these are green swathes, again, memories of Letchworth or, and Bournemouth. This is a very bland, this is a diagram I don't like, and I didn't put it in the exhibition, using a, a rubber stamp to just give some idea of the density of, of the city. But it has two English Midlands overturns for my liking, so I booted it out of the exhibition. Um, these are diagrams about intention and diagrams about type. What I was interested, again, is, is meshing together different objective types of city. This is a rotational city. This is a chain, chain housing city, viaduct cities, villas, other types, swathes, meshed, always collaged, as it were, one over the other. And, in fact, I dug up a real oldie. I dug up my fourth year, three week office project that I'd done in 1959 at the AA as a fourth year student. I'd done this project under Killick, which had this idea for really good offices. The idea of the really good office was that each floor would have an open top with a garden on it. And they would revolve around the central core. Very expensive, but nice idea. And I've always thought it was a bloody... I, was, I, I, I just simply cribbed myself. I just borrowed back out of the very old back pocket. I mean, the back pocket of the old, oldest pair of trousers, as it were. And thought, let's, let's see what happens if we use this as part of the layer city. And so 
one of the conditions of the city is this patch of rotating offices going down the hill. And here is the shadow house again. So this is a local drawing of what happens across the street from the shadow house. Here's the shadow house with the garden end. And one extends the garden <coughs> and suggests that there would be further gardens of rather, rather Viennese tradition gardens with rib riddled with little paths. There's a secondary system of small pavilions that's making its own matrix across the city. There's the green sways, these green, very English sort of green paths with trees that go up against the tennis net. Held woods, they're sort of thin woods that intensify towards the net and have villas creeping in on them. Then there's further sets of systems and the rotating offices which also use the same grid as the villas. So there's that series, this series, this series, that series, and this series. There are about five series working with each other. And uh, there's a section done after the model and the plan of the, the house, the piece facing the countryside, the support structure, the entrance, Tempietto, the water dropping down from the hill, waterfall, the small uh, pavilions, the rotating offices, the green swathe, the villas, and on. Rotating, the villas becoming part of the same system. More offices rotate. I don't like these anymore, but I don't know why I did them like that. They, I did. <coughs> uh, applied facades, waterfalls, the swathe, the villa in the swathe, etc. Elsewhere in the town, a very Nordic situation, this a very Nordic piece of hillside, a uh, megastructure dug up again out of another back pocket. How about looking at megastructure again? It was far enough on, far enough detached from the days of plug-in to say, let's have another look at it, but used in a much more uh, fallen Rome kind of way, used in a much more MGM kind of the way, and then layered pieces of building and pieces of Nordic nighttime lantern, which I'll come on to a bit later. And here's the fast-flowing river with its little bits of islands and, of course, artificial building in amongst them. Spooky hotel. I think that's a spooky hotel. Not sure. And lower down, combining ideas. I've always liked arcades and I've always liked canals. So how about a water arcade? And probably Dutch overturns to it. So the core of the building is actually the water arcade. And the reference such things as these, a Bristol dock or a, a Hamburg, I think, dock. Is it Liverpool? Same, same difference. <coughs> and the lower part of the town, with the increased use of the megastructure parts, and then, finally, at the most disintegrative part of the town is the most heroic object i.e. the series of towers, which were also drawn in Oslo, and somebody said are very Norwegian colouring. I mean, it's only what somebody said. Eh? <laughs> um, more or less simultaneously, and I suppose one, since I didn't do any more houses to the project, one has to use this as a sort of model of the suburban part of the city, uh, the two-studio house, which involves a kitchen garden with rotational planting and a private garden which contains a lot of trompe l'oeil elements which you would only see from the house itself and they're hidden behind this hedge you just get a hint of the of some of the trompe l'oeil elements but they're actually mostly seen from from within and there's a pool and a small a small sitting garden uh, and then the working garden, the 
two studios and the house behind. Dug into the ground, so it's quite a lot of cross, it's really an extension of the, in many ways, although it doesn't look like it, of the yellow house, the fried egg. And of course a cross reference, because it was going on at the same time to Chris's uh, Porchester Baths, which is also involves, I suppose, a slightly similar architecture. A funny one here, which I couldn't use in the exhibition, although I would have loved to, because uh, the company that paid us the money kept the drawing. There's a very, one of those nice things that happens all too, too seldom, was an invitation and a large sum of money to go to Berlin and work in the design center for one week in a studio with other people on the subject of food. And what, what, I mean, you know, that's every evening in the Paris bar and every, every part of the day working on something to do with food and paid a lot of money for it with a series of, of uh, other people. And then I name dropped because the other people were Hollein, Sotsas, uh, Kubelka, and Stefan Bavurka, and so on. And, and about a group of six people, and we were all doing these ridiculous things for food, which were then taken away by the Italian company that paid us. And my, somehow or other, I got talked into by the others, so I claim, into doing fish and chips. They said, you're English, fish and chips. And I did a fish and chip strip. Um, and of course, it then I, this is, the, this is the, one of the schemes where I used hammer papier, by the way. It's hard working paper. And the fish and chip strip has lots of autobiographical references. The seaside lad with the fisherman in the, in the yellow, the yellow uh, sou'wester, whatever it is, the hat. The fish as the captive object seen by the visitors on the end of the pier, the, 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 the trapped but heroic object seen on the end of the pier. And the fish and chips itself, the <laughs> Actually, daft. The potatoes somehow are rolled down the hill from the potato farms on the top. The oil is brought ceremonially into the copper pot. It's heated by a series of Bunsen burners, memories of school. And here is the, the chipper cutter. There's no person doing the chipping cutting, but there is the, the chipper cutter. There's the pan and the, the person, the, the, the efficient chip man, sits at that stool. The fish and chips, the, the, the hot frying fish and chips, therefore, roll along here. And you sit in these chairs facing in with, with newspaper, which is used as a tablecloth. And then there's somehow, I'm not quite sure how you would do this, but, but somehow you could also choose fish floating behind you, coming down off the hillside. That's a ridiculous thing. But great fun <laughs> at the time. And I, my performance, in, uh, we all had to, like a jury, like a crypt, present our project. And I had to send somebody out to get that day's flown-in copy of the Daily Mirror. And somebody had to go to the Cardeve to get this sort of <laughs> pre-frozen fish. And somebody had to go somewhere else to get the chips. And I was about the fourth person on. And these awful fish and chips are getting more and more cold and more and more stale. And of course, I had to eat them for the performance. <coughs> the king of the whole show was Peter Gabelka, who actually did a, a diatribe on the idea of pre-frozen chicken and had a series of carrier bags with plastic chickens in them. She then proceeded to put pineapples and sage and all sorts of things on. Anyway, it was a great laugh. And I, I think I... Nothing to do really with the other people there, but I felt that I wanted on this occasion not to draw in the way that I normally draw. And I've never used that sort of technique again. I don't know why. I actually was sort of playing a game with myself. Could I actually do this very sort of realistic um, type of tight arsed craning and penciling on this very hard paper. I don't know why I haven't done that. I, somehow, it, the whole thing seemed to be very artificial and very strange. You know, the whole thing was quite sort of like in a capsule, as it were. And, and one felt, let's even draw differently about something different. 
Um, back to Oslo. Oslo has this very good building, and the one other thing of taste that I share with Leo Creer is a liking for this particular building. We both think it's the best thing that ever happened to Oslo, the building of the town hall. Um, meanwhile, in the same town uh, is a building that was actually done by Eric Mendelssohn and a couple of young locals, and he knocked out this, this building that was built in Oslo, and is near to the site of this project. There are also a number of other curved cornered buildings in that part of town. And I did some consultancy work for a firm called Platters in Oslo. And I knocked out a scheme for offices and shops opposite the main railway station in about eight days. I did this eight day scheme for this Triangle Thompson site. And one of the things I wanted to pick up was the, the series of passageways that exist in this part of town and the kind of very typical European 